Amen. This month we've been talking about Jesus revealed in the Old Testament. I think this series could, could have been Jesus throughout the Bible. Amen. Uh, I think we talked about him in Isaiah. We talked him about uh, being revealed by David. And today we will talk about Jesus being revealed in Hosea. Hosea is a book that's in the, in the prophets, like at the beginning of the prophets. And we're going to talk about it today. Amen. And uh, as I was going through this message, I said to myself, I'm going to, I went back to the beginning and, and I wrote this. I want to start today's message with a declaration. Without a doubt, God is good in everything he does. His love is unmeasurable. Its death is incomprehensible and unreachable in our human form. Can the brightest human mind fathom even the surface of God's being, ex ex existence, existence or substance? Our God is love. And in the minimal intelligence and imagination and how I see, understand and perceive the Bible, I see this almighty God chasing me throughout the Old and New Testament just to stop me from my busy life and say this, I love you. Throughout this book, the Bible, he uses law, war, life, death, angels, prophets, poetry, romance, diverse examples, parables, sacrifices, and sacrifice. God is not looking to create a religion. God is not trying to make church monkeys. God is not trying to make men and women to come to church like robots and follow rules without asking. But he is calling people to be loved and to love, even though we don't understand. Amen? Today's title message is, and it's going to be a little funny, love conquers all in everything. Love conquers all in everything. I chose this, but I asked Pastor Nea, should I say love conquers everything in all? But I like all in everything. Or everything in everything, all in all. We can see Jesus in the Old Testament as a person, as an action, as a symbol, or as a shadow of what was to come. The coming, the suffering, the death and resurrection of Jesus was announced centuries before his birth. We've been talking about this. We talked about Isaiah, if I'm not wrong, Isaiah probably... Is Isaiah or Jeremiah probably one of the first books of the, of the prophets? There's major, pro, uh, major or big prophets and minor prophets. But we've been talking about, and I think I showed you in the first sin of this month that, it, you know, the Bible's been talking about Jesus since Genesis. And we can see throughout the Bible a symbol, a figure, or just talking about Jesus. And we can actually see Jesus as a person. When Joshua was about to go against Jericho, he went out to pray. And as he was there by himself, somebody came up. And he couldn't see and he shouted out. And it was funny because he shouted out, Are you on our side or one of our enemies? I mean, if it was... His enemy, he would answer with a bullet. Boom. <laughs> Does that tell you something? But that person answered to Joshua. No, but today I come as the captain of the army of, of, of the, the heavenly arms. And as 
Joshua get close to him and so he said oh please take your sandals off because where you stand is holy ground now do you think an angel would just would say that no that was Jesus in person to talk to Joshua how he would want the battle how they would knock down the walls of Jericho so we can see Jesus and I, and I get excited I get excited with the Bible because the Bible is the history of Israel. You're going to see wars. You're going to see killing. You might think that the God of the New Testament is not the God that we preach today. But if you see everything that God does is out of love to those that he loves. There's a song that we sing here. It calls So Will I. And it says that not even a syllable of a sound that comes out of God's mouth is in vain. Everything God does, it's with a purpose. God just don't, he doesn't do things just, just for the heck of it. He does with the meaning. God is wonderful. I already read the whole Bible. That doesn't mean I know or remember every story and every verse. But as far as I remember, there is no other book of the Bible in which God opens his heart like in Hosea. God wants mankind to know his feeling. And please understand God's language. He's not complaining. And he certainly is not punishing Hosea God is simply telling us how much he loves us and if you don't know the book of Hosea is probably the most shocking book in the whole of the Old Testament not because of what Hosea went through but because it reveals what God has gone through for us and there is the clue of how Hosea fits in our series, Jesus is reading the Old Testament. Do you know what Hosea means? You know, every name has a meaning. That's why when we name our child, you know, we should look for what, what it means. Like a lot of Jewish people like to call their kids Jacob. You know what Jacob means? The deceiver. So you got to think about the name Hosea is related to Joshua or Yeshua, which means salvation. So Hosea has the same name of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Messiah, or Jesus means salvation. The parables between Hosea and Jesus are remarkable. You, you got to read this book in, in, you know, and pray, and you're going to see... Jesus' fingerprints all over the book. Let's see how this story unfolds. Hosea was a young preacher in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom. He was a contemporary of the prophets Isaiah and Amos. So he lived in the same time of Hosea. Oh, of Isaiah. You remember Isaiah said that, you know, a child was born, to us was given. His name will be Prince of Peace. He'll be Emmanuel, God with us. Remember all that? I always read that at, at, at Christmas time, even though, you know, we're not sure if Jesus was born there. But I always read that. I, I can't remember if it's Isaiah 6, 9 or Isaiah 9. Uh, he lived, as, as we are told, if you read the first, uh, uh, Hosea 1, 1, in the first verse during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotan, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. They were all kings of Judah. And during the reign of Jeroboam, the king of Israel. At this time, the nation of Israel was divided. There were Republicans and Democrats. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, was the, it was the north and the south. The north was known as the northern kingdom, and the south was known as Judah, the, king, uh, the kingdom of Judah. Amen? But where Hosea stands out is that instead of delivering his message verbally, like every other prophet, they would come out to the people and say, Thus says the Lord, repent of your sins, turn to God, and He's going to be your God, and He's going to bless you. 
No, Hosea was different. Hosea had to deliver his message visibly, quite dramatically, through his marriage, through his wife, and even through the choice of the names of his children. Amen. I want to go through a few points if we can get to all of it. I mean, I believe we should do one day this, the book, oops, is it going to fall? The book of Hosea in one month. So let's look at the childhood of Jesus and the parallels it makes with the book of Isaiah. Now pay attention to this. In Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. That is what says Hosea 11, 1. In the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, this is New Testament, New Testament says, So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed at until the death of Harold. Harold wants to kill the babies that was from a newborns to two years. So he left. He, they fled to Egypt. And was... And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophets. Out of Egypt, I called my son. So as Hosea is talking about the nation of Israel. In the book of Matthew, he's talking about the nation of Israel in Jesus Christ. And in verse 19, 20 of the same uh, chapter of uh, Matthew says, The angel appeared in a dream and told Joseph to bring Jesus back to Israel because Herod, Herod was dead. So God used an angel to call out his son out of Egypt to come back to the nation. Do you see the parallel over there? How about Hosea chapter 3, five, uh, chapter three verse 5? It says, afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. How could they seek the Lord? Yes, they could seek the Lord any day, but how could they seek King David? Now when Hosea... Hosea was talking about this. He talked about the King Uzziah and all, all those kings. King David was dead for about 200 years. Would they seek the dead? Who is Hosea talking about here? Who is well known for the root of David or the son of David? I, I, I did this on purpose. I read in the King James Version. That's what it says here. But on the New Living Translation on an NIV it says, They will seek the Lord their God and to David's descendant their king. It's talking about the royalty of Jesus the king. Look what uh, Matthew, I mean Luke 19 says on Palm Sunday. 38 and 30, 37, 30 says, When he come near the place where the road goes down to the mountain of olives, the whole crowd of disciples begin joyfully to praise God in loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. He said, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So the Jews that was there in Jerusalem, the ones that was following Jesus and seeing all what Jesus was doing, he, they said, blessed is the king. What, what, what do they say here? On Hosea 3, 3, 3, 5, and their king, David, or their descent, David's descendants, their king. 
So as Hosea is saying what's going to happen in the future. Look what it says in Matthew 21, 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So the people of Israel, recognizing Jesus, let me rephrase that, not the whole nation of Israel, not the Pharisees, the Sadducees, but the people that followed Jesus and saw his miracles, not just his disciples, because some of them were following him because of the food. And when things got too tight, they left. But there is Jesus revealed in Hosea. Three, the cross of Jesus, the Redeemer. Now, this is interesting. You have to really look in, you know, between the, par the, uh, the, the, the paragraph. It says, yet I will show love to Judah and I will save them. Now, listen to this. Not by bow, sword, or battle, or by horses and horsemen, but I, the Lord, their God, will save them. How could the people understand this where a time when all you conquered was through blood and, and battle? Even today, you don't go conquer, you know, a country would say like, hey, how you doing? We want your land. We want your oil and everything else. Just shut up and, and, and go to your house. You go with bombs. You go with battle. So how would God conquer Let's read it again. Yet I will show love to Judah and I will save them. How would God save them with not using a bow, a sword, a battle, or horsemen and horses? But he says, but I, the Lord their God, will save them. Or it's, it, it's almost saying like, I myself will go down there and save them. For I will not send an army. I will not send angels. Or spirits. I will, I will do it myself. In Peter, the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed. Redeemed, saved, bought back. Saved from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So God himself came down to earth, became flesh, and he himself saved us. Without, well not to say without bows and arrows, with, with the sword. Just one sword. Cut the, the soldier's ear. And even that, Jesus went there and super glued together. In the 19th century, scholar E.B. Pusey writes, the word rendered ransom signifies rescue by the payment of a price. The word rendered redeem relates to one who, as the nearest of kin, had the right to acquire anything as his own by paying the price. He says that both words in their most exact sense describe what Jesus did for us. No sword bow or arrows at the cross he attracted us and conquered all in everything amen number four does Hosea talk about the resurrection of Jesus oh he didn't say oh there's a guy that's gonna come he's gonna be hanged he's gonna be killed and then he's gonna come from the dead then again you have to look pretty good this was the first verse that I as a Christian memorized Hosea 6 1 to 3 and I hold dearly in my heart because back then we didn't have smartphones I actually still have these letters in my house for my father in faith he sent it to me from Brazil through this snail mail believe it or not they're still around if you want this today send a letter to somebody that you love if you have their address Hosea 6 verse 2 says, and, and look how interesting this is. 
After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. Jesus died and for three days, the Bible says he was in the belly of the earth. But because on the second day, he revived us. Or that means in the second day, he gave us life again. But revive and restore is something, two things different. But on the third day, he restore us. What it means to restore, I talked about this a few, maybe a few years ago. Maybe you don't remember. Restore means to bring back to the original state. So if you, if you take a 1969 Mustang, that's the car I like. And you find it all rusted and all that, and, and you paint it, and you know, and you buy parts from Ford or from some you know a company that just do that, and you make it look good and you make it shiny. Now you restore that car to the original state when it came out of the 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 mounting line or, or the line, the assembly assembly line, right? So what it that means? For you to be restored. He revived you and then restored you. Let me bring you back to Genesis. The Bible says in the turn of the day God would come and have fellowship with Adam and Eve. The Bible also says that they were naked. But they were not ashamed of each other and they were not ashamed of God because God's glory surrounded them. But when Adam sinned, he hid from God. So that tells me that before he sinned, he didn't have to hide from God. That actually Adam and Eve would talk to God face to face. They had free access to talk to God. The Bible doesn't say that, that, but maybe, in my imagination, this is Pastor David, David imagined that maybe Adam and Eve would see, sit in God's lap like a child sits in their parents' lap. I believe that maybe Adam and Eve would lay their head in God's chest and hear him breathing. I believe that they would feel the warmth of God's glory and God's power. Can you imagine you're sitting in God's lap and you feel his almighty power? So this is what it means when Jesus died. He not only brought us life, but he restored us to our original state so that we could stand today in God's presence. So can you see? The parallel and comparison, the comparison between the two. Look, chapter 24, 46, 44, 46 says, He said to them, this is what I told you while I'm still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Hosea 13, 14. I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from the death. Oh, where, oh, death are your plagues. Where, oh, death is your destruction. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, 57. Where all death is your victory. Where all death is your sting. The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me talk to you again. God is not trying to create a religion. All God is doing is showing you how much he loves us. All God wants from us is love him back.
Now this is interesting. The betrothal of Jesus, the bridegroom. The parallels between Hosea and Jesus are most obvious when you consider what the Lord God asked Hosea to do. This is why this is a shocking book. The Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. So this is how he brought the message to the people of Israel. God told him, go and marry a prostitute. And she's going to leave you. And you go over there and you buy her back again. He's talking about you and me. Not as prostitution in the flesh, but we seek everything else but God. But Hosea had to go through this in the flesh. If you read the Bible, you're going to see that Hosea went and married this woman. And she kept leaving him to go to other men. You know what Hosea did? He went there and asked how much she would cost. And he bought her back. I could be wrong. Please do not quote on, on, you know, me on this. But I, I, I think I studied this. And the value that he paid for Gomer, his wife, was the same value that was paid to Judas. Now, what did Jesus do when he came on earth? What did he come here to do? He came to buy Gomer back to him. For the Bible says... In Ephesians 5.27, husbands love your wife just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So Jesus came to this earth and he paid the price for you and me so that today we be called the bride, the church, the radiant church, without blemish. And for his life was paid some shekels of silver. As Hosea was called to marry an unfaithful wife, so was Jesus. As Hosea paid the price, demanded to freedom a slave to buy back his unfaithful bride, so this did Jesus. Now, if you read the book of Hosea, again I will tell you, you're not going to see a book where God is complaining. You're not going to see a book where God is punishing Hosea. You're not going to see a book where God is punishing the people of Israel. But you're going to see a book where God is saying, this is what I go for. That's what I go through for you. That is what I will do for you. I don't care where you are. I don't care where you go. I don't care what you have. I will chase you. There was a friend that many, many years ago, we were working in the radio, in a radio station in Framingham. And this was all volunteer work. It was a Christian, it was an American Christian radio. And, and they gave us two hours to do program in Portuguese. Oh, man, I got so excited because I would uh, record on cassette tapes. I would ask Pastor Nanny to record, and then I could hear my voice on the radio. It was so fun, so funny. But Simone Ferreira used to say, while there is breath, the plan of salvation still stands. Do you understand what that means? 
that while you're breathing, God is chasing you. While you're breathing, God is trying to corn corner you. You can play hide and seek, but you can't hide from God. You read Psalm 139, you're going to see that even if your bed is made in hell, there God is. Oh, God loves you. But perhaps the ultimate message of Hosea is not the controversy surrounding his marriage, but the way in which the Lord Jesus remembered Hosea and quotes from Hosea. When Jesus was asked by the Pharisees why he ate with tax collectors and sinners, he answered, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is in Matthew 9.3. Guess what it says in Hosea 6.6. 6, 6. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, in acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Jesus was telling the Pharisees, go do their homework. Go study the words of Hosea. Find God's will for your life. That's how Jesus remembered Hosea. Then three chapters later in the same book of Matthew, chapter 12, Jesus and his disciples plucking and eating grain on the Sabbath. This is clearly unlawful and the Pharisees said so. Jesus, however, explained to them the story of David eating unlawfully. And then Jesus says, if you had known what this word means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, you see Jesus is talking about the Old Testament. He's saying the same thing that God says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. How many religions today require sacrifice? I'm not saying that you shouldn't sacrifice, but sacrifice should never be me a means of salvation. But sacrifice is an action of love, submission, and obedience. Sacrifice is an action of trusting God. The God, that almighty God, the creator of the whole world that has your best interest in mind. God says, for I know the thoughts I have for you. I think about you and I want to give you a good future. And a future that your heart desires. That's what God says. God is never looking at you and setting a trap so you could fall. But he's always looking for you and saying, be careful, there's a trap over there, go this way. Then you ask me, Pastor David, how come there's so much suffering? Why does bad things happen to good people? Do you want the answer for that? Well, go pray and ask God because I don't know. <laughs> but when Job, in one day, had bad news that you couldn't resist, you'd probably kill yourself. He, the woman, the only thing that was left over to him it was the wife. And she tells, well, curse this God of yours and kill yourself. You woman, you talk like a foolish woman. Would I learn to accept the good and not the bad that comes from my God? If something bad is happening in my life, there is a reason for it. Because God does not do anything in vain. He doesn't live a syllable separate or in empty space. God is perfect. Today's title message is love conquers all in everything. And I want to end with this. I want to break this word conquer. I went to the dictionary. Sometimes I agree with dictionary and sometimes I don't know who wrote it. Let me break it down, the word conquer, according to the English dictionary. To, to gain or acquire by force of arms, subjugate, conquer territory. God's love is manifested in the flesh through Jesus. 
If we surrender to him, he will conquer all areas of our being. Conquer means to overcome by force of arms or to vanquish. Conquered the enemy. Let me tell you something. Romans 16, 20 says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Now, couldn't God crush Satan somewhere else? But the Bible says in Genesis 3, 15, it says, I'm going to put enmity between you, woman, and your seed. No, he's talking to the, I'm sorry, to the serpent. So the, it says, the seed of the woman, you're going to bite its ankle, but they will step on your head. How do you kill a snake? You smash the head. Do not cut in a half. It has to still be alive for a little bit. Yes. So you crush the head. The Bible says, and let me tell you something. I'm not talking you. I'm not telling you to go play with the devil. Do you know what you do with the devil? You ignore him. You don't talk to him. You let God do the work. The Bible says for us to get closer to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. So don't argue with him. There is no time by arguing with the devil. The last time somebody tried to argue with him, and she ate the, ate the fruit. So do not argue with the devil. Say, devil, I rebuke in the name of Jesus. My future is with the Lord. I am living forever with him because he's my God. He is my father. He's my savior. And I'm going to be away from you. Now, third, conquer means to gain mastery over or win by overcoming obstacles or opposition, like conquering a mountain. The Bible in Isaiah 41 tells you, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your hand, your right hand actually, and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. And lastly, to overcome by conquer by over to overcome by mental or moral power or surmount. This is your mental power. Let me tell you what your mental power should be today. Romans 8 37 says, No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loved us. And I am convinced. That nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. Neither our fears of today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is your mental power. Not to convince yourselves, but to know yourselves that nothing can separate you from the love of God.